Well, good morning, beloved church. Good morning. And resurrection blessings to you on this second Sunday in Lent. We gather today as we always do to pray for and support one another and the world in response to the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Today's worship materials and Sunday school lessons can all be found on our website, messiahlindhurst.org. Check them out there. Midweek Lenten Vespers continue this week. We're thankful for a good beginning last Wednesday, and we'll gather again to sing our evening prayer this Wednesday around 7 o'clock. That video will also be available on the website along with the bulletin. Each week, uh, those services will be featuring a new spiritual discipline, um, spiritual practice, and this week will be focused on stewardship and giving. Uh, we also continue to need readers for Sunday services in March. I think there's at least a couple openings, uh, but it's filling up. So if that's a ministry that you would like to participate in, um, check that out on the website. And now, as God gathers us today, we prepare for worship with the music of the prelude. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour, pour out, out your, your mercy, mercy over, over us. Our, our sin is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined, and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the Spirit to follow the ways of Jesus, 
as As healers and and restorers of the world world you so love. Amen. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Amen. grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram, and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make a covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God says to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offsprings after you throughout their generations.
for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offsprings after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, she shall not be called Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us read responsively Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all of you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim for generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted. The second reading is from Romans 4. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to dead and calls into existence things that do not exist, hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not only for his sake alone, but for ours also. 
It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. This time, I'd like to invite our younger members uh, to draw near here for, uh, for a minute or two for our children's moment together. Um, one of the things that we are hearing about in uh, the first reading today from Genesis of Sarah and Abraham is that Sarah and Abraham originally had different names. It was uh, Sarai and Abram, um, but they got new names um, when God promised some things to them. And one of the things that they got in their names was the letter H. And now in Hebrew, um, the letter H is always pronounced when people would say the phrase Hashem, which means the name, which refers to the name of God. It was a way for people to avoid saying the actual name of God in, in reverence for the holiness of God's name. And so I think it's kind of cool that Sarah and Abraham get that letter H in their names, a little bit of God's name in their names. Um, and so I thought maybe we could get marked with a little bit of God's name um, in our lives this week. And so I'm going to ask you to get some help from the adults who are with you. And I want you to grab a pen, a marker, maybe if you've got one. It doesn't have to be a permanent marker. I've got a Sharpie just because that's what we have in the house. Uh, but maybe something that washes off a little more easily might be good. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make the letter H right here on my hand. And remember that I am part of who God is. That God's name is with me. Um, Hashem. Would you like that on your hand? You don't have to have it on your hand. <laughs> I have to work today. so um, <laughs> And I talk with my hands a lot. Yeah, so No problem. But maybe later. No problem. Cool. Maybe well, if we had washable markers. If we had washable markers, yes. that'd be different. So, yeah. So, thank you, um, parents, adults, families, for helping uh, your young ones. Um, but we hope that this is a meaningful way to remember God's presence with you this this day. And so now, the Holy Gospel according to Saint Mark. Glory to, to you, you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the son of humanity must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Humanity will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to, to you, you, O Christ. Covenants and baptism. 
covenants and baptism. In this season of Lent, in this second year of the lectionary cycle, year B, which we're in right now, week by week, we hear this series of scripture stories that draw connections for us between scripture's covenants and our baptism. Covenants and baptism, which perhaps may not be quite as separated as we might think. Last week we heard of the covenant God makes with Noah and the world, where God hangs up the war bow after the flooding of the earth and signals an end to genocide-level acts of divine violence. It's a new beginning that we heard of, like we experience in our baptism. Sin and death are flooded out of our lives, and we begin our journey of faith rooted in God's mercy and love. The analogy isn't perfect, of course, but it gives us a starting point. Covenant baptism. And today we hear of another covenant, marking another new beginning. It's typically referred to as the Abrahamic covenant, or the covenant that God makes with Sarah and Abraham and their offspring. This family becomes the foundation of the nation of the the people of God. In fact, it ends up being the foundation of uh, the three uh, Abrahamic faiths, as we call them, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. I will make my covenant between me and you, God says in Genesis, as we have it. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. And as for Sarah, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. She shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. I will make you exceedingly numerous, God says. Exceedingly numerous. Which is really something, given that at this point in the story, Sarah and Abraham are the better part of a hundred years old. (laughs) I mean, just the pregnancy side of things seems nearly impossible, let alone the chasing after the youngsters that supposedly follows as they are then brought up. Oof. Yeah. Yet it is a new beginning. As improbable and as impossible as it all seems. And although it's often referred to as the Abrahamic covenant, Sarah may have more of a prominent role than we might think. And indeed, there may have actually been two ancient storylines, one for Sarah and one for Abraham that were later drawn down into a single account. And there is some significant scholarship that suggests the Sarah story was just as central as the Abraham one, if not more so. But over the years, the redactors of Scripture seem to have favored the more socially comfortable notion of a male protagonist with a male God, as told from a male point of view, predominantly for men to study and teach and preach. Giant eye roll. Mm -hmm. But our first clue regarding Sarah's centrality comes from the name change that these two experience at this juncture in the story that we hear today and the symbolism of what their names mean. First of all, name changes are significant in and of themselves as they mark a shift in identity. Just as when any of us would undergo a a name change due to the varying life circumstances that warrant it, A change in name accompanies a change in identity. They're connected. And Sarai and Abram both receive that H character like we spoke of in the children's moment. And that H sound to their names. That significant character, that sound that comes when the name of the divine is spoken, Hashem. And so Abram becomes Abraham and Sarai becomes Sarah. 
They are changed, marked with God's divinity. But there's more to it than just the H sound. For the first sounds of Abraham's name, A-B, Ab, connect to the word father, right? Abba, sometimes we hear, as in also father of many nations, as it's said to mean here, Abraham, which makes sense. But the linguistic characters of Sarah's name go much, much further. For the Hebrew characters that begin Sarah's name, the S and the R sound are found in many other Hebrew words, such as captain and official and officer and commander and chief and governor and prince or royal, as found in the title Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. Sarah's name is of profound prominence, denoting leadership and power beyond the status of parenthood, and may even be echoed in the title of the nation Israel itself, with S and R being the central consonant sounds of that name, too. Sarah, Israel. Not to mention when the person of God is referenced in verse 1 of today's text. The English is a rather flat translation of the Hebrew El Shaddai. We get it as God Almighty, but it's closer to something like the God above the mountain peaks, the God above the breast-like mountain peaks, which in other parts of scripture is often connected with images of Fertility and procreation and nourishment, revealing a God who births nations and gives divine milk, one who literally produces and sustains new life in the world. We may not expect Sarah to be the central figure of the covenant and the mother of the nation of the mothering God, but perhaps such is the way of divinity even if a way seems unfamiliar or uncomfortable or impossible. In the gospel text today, disciple Peter also has a similar moment of discomfort and unfamiliarity when Jesus proclaims proclaims openly that he must soon undergo great suffering and be killed. Peter even rebukes Jesus, the gospel story tells, which is understandable. Peter has already given up so much to follow in the way of the gospel. He's given up his location, his vocation, and now he has to give up his friend, Jesus, too. Peter was not expecting Jesus' death to usher in new life, as chaplain Julia Frazier notes in her commentary on this text. But even when God catches us by surprise and reorients us to truth that turns our world upside down, God does not abandon us, but instead goes with us through it. Today's gospel text from Mark then ends with a rather heart-wrenching suggestion that Jesus will be ashamed of us if we are ashamed of him, which I'm not totally sure about, but I think such strong language attempts to get at the depth of what's at stake in all of this. For God's way of new life, birthing new life into the world, is indeed good news for us. As God brings healing and sustenance to all these places where we know it is so deeply needed, but we're also reminded that this new life does not come cheaply or easily, and that much sacrifice goes into making it real. And we are invited then to respond to that as we are able. Does this mean we give and give and give, bearing our cross until we have nothing left? I'm not sure if that's exactly what it means. But perhaps it does mean that God, El Shaddai, 
will make a way for something new to be birthed and sustained even when it seems like such a thing cannot possibly be so. And so I leave us today with the words of poet Rupi Kaur that I hope invite us to ponder the ways divinity is present unexpectedly in our lives and in our world. She writes, Did you think I was a city big enough for a weekend getaway? I am the town surrounding it, the one you've never heard of but always pass through. There are no neon lights here, no skyscrapers or statutes, statues, but there is thunder, for I make bridges tremble. I am not street meat, I am homemade jam thick enough to cut the sweetest thing your lips will touch. I am not police sirens. I am the crackle of a fireplace. I'd burn you, and you still couldn't take your eyes off me, because I'd look so beautiful doing it, you'd blush. I'm not a hotel room. I am home. I'm not the whiskey you want, I'm the water you need. Don't come here with expectations and try to make a vacation out of me.
relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. All the ends of the earth worship you, from galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot yet even imagine. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are weak or grieving. Bring vindication for the victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. We specifically pray for Jim, Don, Tracy, Gail, Sarah, Janie, Paul, Adam, Maury, Chris, Lisa, Pam, Phyllis, Kathy, Jim, and all those in need of comfort and healing. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Also with you. Please proclaim peace into one another's, one another's lives today. As you're able, near and far. <laughs> peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace, Rosemary. Peace, Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> peace, everyone. Peace. Uh, we continue to be so thankful for uh, the gifts uh, given to make ministry here and around the world possible. Um, if, uh, if you would like to contribute to this ministry, we invite you uh, to find the link on our website uh, to give. Uh, but if you'd also like to set up something more regular and recurring, uh, we can help with that too if you reached out to the church office. Um, but we are so thankful for the many gifts God has given us that have sustained us, and we hope that we can give of those to sustain others as well. And now we have uh, some offering music uh, from Vicki. Oh, my God. 
Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As God has gathered us and filled our hearts with the gospel, now God sends us forth to serve in mission. Let us pray. Gracious Gracious God, God, through through belief in Christ Christ, and through the the presence presence of the Holy Spirit Spirit within us, empower us to share the word, care and support each other and God's God's community, worship worship as a family in Christ, and be Christ-like examples to those whose lives we touch. Amen. You are what God made you to be. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Amen. peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.
All right, we're going to finish this up, Rosemary. You going to help? Good girl. Ha, ha, ha.